Good evening, Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans and everybody watching. Welcome to our fireside chat for this week where we've got an incredible lineup of speakers. We've got two women particularly who hail from a very culturally diverse background, V being one, and we've got Rothio as well, both of whom have worked multiple markets while versed on our subject matter, which is social and cultural intelligence. Our usual hosts, Chinasai, Ravenico, and Mona Lisa in the house as well. So we wanted to know, based off feedback we received, whether there is indeed a space in the corporate world or in the workplace for... Um, I can't particularly who hail from a, a very culturally diverse background. Social and cultural intelligence. <laughs> That's the remixed version, right? <laughs> it's on Facebook now. <laughs> yes, it is. We're mixing things up and making it interesting. So we've got two guests today, B and Rafio. B is an HR exec who's worked across multiple geographies. She's worked with a thoroughly diverse group of colleagues and is well-versed in this area. And Rafio, who is an engineer by trade, but runs her own e-commerce platform, is as well exposed to multiple geographies Africa included so we just wanted to kind of hear from these ladies what their thoughts are and of course put our thoughts into the debate and just discuss whether there is a need for any form of social or cultural intelligence in the workplace to frame it I might just start off with B could you explain to us what the concept of social intelligence is and whether it's interchangeable with emotional intelligence, because that's a phrase that we've often heard being branded around training sessions and so forth. Thank you, Mucha. Great to be here. And um, I will try and start with explaining this concept of social intelligence, which is uh, it's a, it's a very white concept, right? It has a lot of layers into it. And I think the emotional intelligence, as you're saying, is something that is used a lot in books and trainings and all that sort of things. And it, it uh, evolved into sort of a social intelligence, which is a bit broader still than emotional intelligence. But social intelligence would be, there's a different, different things in there. So it's your empathy, it's your ability to read situations situations to read people it is how your social skills work and how you interpret the social skills of the of the other people um, that that you need to that you need to work with um, and that could be cultural as well right it, it could be cultural but it could also be uh, political um, it could be all sorts of things it's a very wide definition um, so yeah I, I guess there's a lot of different things that come into into social intelligence and it's an extremely important competency or measure, I think, of, of success in general. And Rafio, what's your exposure to the concept of cultural intelligence? So we've heard what social is. Where does the cultural intelligence fit into the landscape? Yeah, I, I totally agree with the concept of empathy. For me, it's kind of uh, blending, but also accept cultural differences uh, to know what we are the same, we are not. And that's the nice thing that's good. Embrace and what we can learn from the other people and understand mostly it's to be humble respect what you see observe and have all those other cultures up and people teach you things and and you can also teach them things understanding it's just a matter of being all together i don't know get to a common common understanding that that what it means to me sure and i think for most of us who've come from one geography and gone global in terms of our career pursuits we've sometimes faced shocks because we've gone into new markets thinking that we know it all we were raised a certain kind of way we've got this in the bag and then you get into a new context where things like addressing people by their first names is an issue. I wanted from our host, let me start with Chinasai, because Chinasai, you left Zim and went to the States. And there's a very different way of expression when you consider Zim and the States. What was your experience with the whole adaptation to social and cultural differences? You know, at that point, I don't think you were thinking about it that way, that there was a difference in culture. It was a lot of excitement. I think what really hits you first is the excitement to be in a different space. And perhaps naturally, it was the excitement to learn about this new culture that was very present because the US generally are very present people and they will tell you how they feel. And then coming from a very conservative background where feelings are not usually a discussion on the table, it was, it was what you would say, in, in essence, a culture shock, but it shocked you so quickly to wanting to learn how to behave, what words do you say, what words do you not say. And I'll give a vivid example of saying rubber and eraser. I mean, you're sitting in class, you pass me the rubber, this is what we say in Zimbabwe, and people are looking at you like, what have you just said? So the shock, um, the shock kind of jolted you into learning very quickly. 
So it was quite a shock. I mean, I know one of my first ones was, oh, there's a zebra crossing over there and people looking at me and wondering what on earth I'm talking about. It's a pedestrian crossing, right? <laughs> so these, the, the struggle is real. Ravenica, what's your take on, on this? So you perhaps have been in Zim a lot more than maybe some of us and you have got your hands-on experience with the Zimbabwean context, very well entrenched in it, but you've had your global exposure as well. Yeah. How important is social oh, and cultural intelligence? Yeah, with, with, with me, um, yeah, I've been in Africa for the most part of my life. I don't have exposure outside of our borders in terms of actually working. Um, so what I would say is um, between Zimbabwe and South Africa, that's what I'll speak to you. But in Zim, you find that um, <laughs> depending on your age, you've got to adapt very quickly because a lot of our organizations have older people, okay, whether we like it or not. Um, especially even these uh, sort of established organizations. So there is an adaptation that's required, um, whether it's um, uh, you know, where in the morning, you know, you've got to sort of greet your boss by his totem, um, as opposed to hello, Bob, um, you know, where outside you're taught that you can talk to your superior by his first name, whereas in Zim, there's sort of this element of forced respect we greet them by their totem. I know for Brie and Rokio, I think maybe it's like a, you know, maybe you don't understand, but totems are just basically like a cultural um, element that we are defined by in our tribes in Africa. So you'll find that um, they make it a big deal where because they're older than you or they're more established than you, they want you to greet them by that because it's considered the highest form of respect. Um, so there are elements like that, and these are just like basic examples. Um, but generally, you know, I find that um, we, need to, we need to separate, um, I think we need to separate, especially in Africa, we need to separate professional and personal. We need to set workplace, find a place of neutrality, because there'll never be a place where we all agree, because we've still got um, tribes and societies within Zimbabwe. So I think you can't please everybody. So my thing would be, no, let's separate, and let's just do work with work, and call each other by what we call each other at work, and then separate it. That's how I look at it. Sure, very good. And Mona Lisa, you're uh, Zim gone to the US. You work in New York, which is a melting pot of cultures. You work in ERs, where I'm sure you're meeting a myriad of types. Talk us through your experience on all things culture and, and uh, social intelligence. For me, I have a similar experience to Chenisai, where I definitely felt that because we were um, sort of the immigrant or somebody coming into that scenario, we were the ones that were sort of tasked with having to have social intelligence or the cultural intelligence to, in order for you to succeed in that sort of environment. And I think it worked out for most of us. We were, I mean, you were motivated to do so. Um, but just kind of touching on, and you know, you kind of go through it. And then later on, when you're established, you're like, um, I mean, especially in this day and age now where everything is sort of centered around acceptance, diversity, like you kind of expect your neighbors or your coworkers to sort of take some time to learn you and have some cultural confidence to where I came from. So, I mean, definitely a lot of those things did come up. I don't expect people to know where Zimbabwe is. I, it's not an expectation I ever had, but I definitely felt that why was it always on us? to learn, you know, and I think this conversation is really going to touch on a lot of things for me in the sense that everybody is sort of responsible for learning kind of what's going on around you. Um, some of the topics that Rue touched on, I think we can go into a little deeper, the ageisms, the womanisms that are involved in a lot of these things. Like I consider myself a feminist and I think a lot of those things will sort of tie into some of the conversations that we're going to have today. So I'm super excited. And hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So B, from a corporate standpoint, this idea of why the onus is on the minority or the foreign person to completely assimilate into a new culture, but the reverse doesn't happen from the employer. Is that something that's looked at? Is it something that's talked about? Can we expect to see change, particularly post George Floyd and everybody feeling that they deserve their legitimate place in the workplace, in this world, make an effort to understand where we come from and our needs? Which I, can I also just add like another part for that for B, maybe just kind of also thinking about a lot of our companies are considered calling themselves global now, right? So mm. is there really like a home culture that anybody needs to learn if the companies are calling themselves global? Nice one, Mona. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good one. So so let me let me just first comment on, on, on what I was hearing because I think what was really interesting was that a lot of you were using the phrases of understanding culture, learning culture. Like I think that's social intelligence, right? That's mm -hmm. that's what it does. You you, you seek to understand, you seek 
seek to learn, um, and and that should go to waste. To to Mona Lisa's point, right? It's it's not a it shouldn't go one way. Now, supposedly, if um, if I take it from a like one person coming from one country going into another country where the far majority uh, is is from that country, um, then there is probably going to be more of a focus on on you having to to assimilate almost into that culture, right? But if you if you have assimilation, so if you look at it from a culture from a corporate perspective, if you have assimilation, you 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 lose a lot, right? You lose the fact that diverse teams um, come have better problem solving, have more innovation. Um, they also have more friction because you know there isn't that sort of common denom denominator um, that that makes it easy to find it. But you you have um, one of some of the research. Um, really points out that the, the issue with non-diverse teams is group thinking. So um, if you have everyone coming from the same background, thinking the same way, you, you might not go with the best idea, but you all kind of, yeah, yeah, this is how we all feel is what we should be doing. Whereas you have diversity in a country and you in a company and you really embrace that, you, you get people that are they're always asking the other question, or have we thought about this? So you get more context. So so ultimately it's it's it gives you as a company more success. But it's also a difficult thing um, to really bring into an organization. And it really has to the the um, it has to be part of a strategy. It cannot be like oh we do diversity and that means that we recruit people from different backgrounds and and that we we bring them into the company and then we're done. And then we have diversity, right? Because on paper, it's different nationalities, different religions, different genders, a whole lot. So it, it really has to be a, a strategy where the, the the top of an organization thinks through. So the senior leadership team, the executive team thinks through what do we want to achieve with the diversity? Um, what are our aims? Um, and, and be very honest about what the aims are. And then from there, start thinking about how can we then bring bring that into an organization. It has to go very deep. Any responses to that, ladies? The onus seems to be on the leadership of organizations to have a strategy and to kind of think through why they want to have uh, or promote, if you like, cultural intelligence. But is that really happening? Or do we expect people to join our global firm and join into our way of doing things because we're the established firm, you want to work for us, so you come and become one of us? In my experience, if I may, may mm, answer, please. I've worked in different places of the world. All companies were less than 50 employees, so it was not like a very big company. Uh, and it was not the CEO's decision to bring in someone from the outside, from Spain in my case. So it was mainly depending on the boss on the manager of that division or the manager of that department. And I think it's not just about the company. Sometimes it's that person who can make the difference. And then that's the person who has to spread that culture or that open mind to, to the rest of the team. And that can be a point a seed that you plant there in a, in a company that's bigger, but maybe no one thought about doing that. One person does it, and then you can start opening your mind and think more about that. So Rafi, I've got a direct question for you, which is, you know, we tend to think about assimilating as Africans going into the West or into, into foreign markets, but we never really think about what it's like for a, a non-African person to enter Africa and work in an African market. What was your experience working in Namibia? Well, it was my first really different experience because before I had been in Germany and in Italy uh, living and working all the places for traveling but not actually working in Namibia I was well before maybe I'm still are I was very naive on some things about racism about where people comes from the color of your skin so I was somehow expecting to get to Namibia and everybody was loving each other and everything was super equal and that did not happen and what happened in my case is that, and that also happened to me in Brazil, uh, because I was from Europe, I was better treated than other people. And in terms of work relationships, I was all right with everybody, <laughs> but that was something that shocked me and was, was, I don't know, very weird to me to realize that it didn't matter how best or, or or not best I was in something. And the fact that I was from Europe gave me better salary or better opportunities than other people. That's not an exact answer to your question, I think, but it goes into uh, professionally, it was fine, normal 
you have to adapt to this. In Spain, we kiss when we met, meet someone. Hello, my name is Rocio. You don't handshake, you kiss. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing that there. But those little things were not as shocking as the fact that my nationality, not something I have not fought, fought for, it was mm -hmm. giving me better chances than to other people, you know? So I mean, to the is panel, so, yeah. so go ahead, man. I was well, just going to say to the panel, do we think that someone should stand up and say, you know what, equalize my salary with the local people, make sure that I don't stand out, make sure I don't have privilege, but purely for a reason that I didn't select. Is that a realistic idea or is it just, well, that's how it works, what to do? I, I'd just like to start by saying, thank goodness it's the time of COVID where you don't have to worry about kissing or handshaking. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> kissing well, might actually way. be safer. <laughs> kissing kissing might know. actually be safer if you just kiss over here. And just like, you know, okay. It's not on the list. <laughs> yeah, so um, I just wanted to add that, remember when we had the previous conversation, we talked about race in the workplace and what we kind of came to as a conclusion um, in terms of CVs and whether you must submit your photograph with a CV. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, you know, this comes back to that to say, at the end of the day, um, if we're talking about global villages, if we're talking about the world being integrated, um, at some point, our cultures must stay at the door, you know, in the same way that, um, you know, we did that with race, uh, where that should not matter. You should leave your culture at the door in the sense that whether you're flying into another country and you've got a portfolio that's um, more important or maybe the same as your colleagues, you should not get preferential treatment. I know that some African countries have a way of treating people of um, different races uh, better because of the colonial history, right? Um, so I'll say specifically, Rothio talked about how when she was there, she was like, she wasn't sure how to dabble. It's not your fault. There are some people, whether it's a pay, whether it's just how you're treated in a queue, whether how you're treated in the supermarket, how it is. people just have a way of giving more value to white people, Caucasian people, Indian people over black people. It's like a black on black thing where we just don't And know it's a reflection to... on themselves, exactly. It's yeah, not it's a reflection on themselves, exactly. And it's not on you. You came into Africa and you're like, oh, you expect to be treated equal and the same, but you got different treatment. And I think that's exactly what it comes down to that us as Africans, need to just stop doing that and stop seeing color and stop bringing our past into our present. Um, that's, that's how I look at it. I definitely want to comment and say vice versa though. I've worked in Asia, like um, in, in Burma and in China. And I tell you as an expat, which is what they would consider me when I land there, um, working clinically in those regions, I'm definitely treated differently. But for me in that particular scenario, I'm like, this is great just because for a change, I'm getting that preferential treatment. But to answer the question direct, and I might just be just as, you know, exciting, just finding to see a black woman in medicine, like the patients are like, no, 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 I want that doctor. You know, sometimes that's what happens. But I mean, to answer Mucha's question directly, um, should people stand up and say, like should Rothio in her situation had gotten up and said, no, I don't think I should get this. Um, I think it's a completely different conversation from like Black Lives Matter. That's the, I don't think that's white privilege like Ru says. That's definitely us doing it to ourselves and maybe somebody else. Let's say a Mona Lisa lands in Namibia and I get a job. And because I trained in the US and now I'm kind of a diasporan coming back and they give me preferential treatment. I see with those lens that I've actually spoken up in those particular scenarios, but I also realized that maybe you have other expenses that perhaps you're getting that different salary or that different thing because they realize that this is not my home. I also need to have like a salary that's going to allow me to pick up and leave to go to Zimbabwe if I need to. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot more to that than just um, saying, no, please pay me the same as a person who lives locally. I must also say that the opposite happened to me in the United States, not with everybody, but sometimes mm -hmm. I would feel that being a Spanish speaker was lowering my professional level, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. It's similar. Genesis. Have you guys ever heard that? Sorry. Uh, of my favorite yeah. genocide? Uh, I, I'm listening intently and, and there seems to be a golden thread that is actually developing, which is learn to learn. I think with cultural intelligence, social intelligence, there is this one element that jumps out and from everyone's um, comments on, on the subject, there is that appetite to learn. And in my experience, um, having lived in the US, worked in South Africa, worked in Kenya, yeah. worked in Zimbabwe, what I have seen that has worked in my experience is one, really not leaving my culture out the door, but really going there as a person, right? And being asking questions, 
Like, I remember when I got to Kenya, Kenya fascinated me. Everything is fascinating. But I didn't want to act like I knew everything. So I would really ask, like, tell me more about this. How do I say good morning? How do I say thank you? Thank you, Asante Sana. And that's how I, I, I build rapport. So what I am picking up from what we're saying is how do we, uh, the whole idea we need to learn to learn, but how do we increase that appetite? How do we motivate people uh, to want to learn other cultures? Because it kind of, it kind of is an icebreaker, right? When you get into someone's space and first thing you want to do is consume their, their uh, culture. How do we increase that appetite to learn? Yeah, Tanisa, I wonder whether when people come in with a superiority complex from the outset, so we've seen this happen, and actually Heather Gloria Ziva Jones makes a comment that's aligned with mine, talking to this idea of expats coming in from the USA or from Europe, typically coming with this non-interest to understand your culture. We've come to Africa. We're not really interested to embed ourselves in this. We've come to provide a service. We know it all. We're going to lift and drop our ideas, and then we're out of here. So I do think that there needs to be a duality in the, the way people see this relationship you know it's give and take perhaps and I'm not sure that always translates no it's absolutely true but this is this is where I think when you talk about social intelligence it talks about strategy cultural intelligence actually has uh, these four arms right and one of them is being strategic right so it's it's a give and take but the question is the receiving end, are we strategic enough to actually understand how to push back? So it's a strategy on both ends. The people who are coming in and the people that are receiving it. And it goes back for me to uh, one of the points that Mona Lisa raised, that we're calling each other global entities. But are we really equipping people to understand cultural intelligence, emotional intelligence, social intelligence? Because mm. the people that are coming in are very clear on these things. But the question is, us on the ground, are our people really clear on what these things mean? It doesn't mean folding your cards and being overly nice. It just might mean knowing when to push back and how to teach someone that, no, no, this is not how we do it, but without burning bridges. The question is, are we teaching on both ends? Are we teaching our people to be able to be culturally intelligent enough to push back when they feel like they're being undermined? So people watching, could you let us know whether we are, could you answer Genesis question? I'm asking our audience to let us know, yes or no, are we teaching people to embrace our cultures, to understand where we're coming from, so that they embed into our societies as much as we're required to embed into theirs. Yes or no will suffice for now. Or if you want to expand on that, please do. But would love to hear from you. So please do comment on, on the on Facebook page. Mona, you're smiling. I definitely think <laughs> no. That's my answer. <laughs> like, I, I definitely think no. I think it's not an African thing at all. I think it's just a lot of like immigrant places that are not super westernized. I think Mill sent a really cool like animation with like the different key strategies of collectivism, different character traits that we have within our cultures. Like I know, um, I mean, just think about how like colonialism and just kind of how Native Americans were taken advantage of in the United States, how like races of people were wiped out just by, you know, the movement of, you know, Western westernization. It's because we're we, our cultures, for the most part, train us to be welcoming, right? We're supposed to welcome strangers. We're supposed to want to learn more about them because we assume that they are going to want to learn about us. So there's this concept of collectivism. Like, I think we're going to do this together and we're going to figure it out together. But the American way or the, you know, super Anglo way, I guess, was the way of thinking about it is capitalism. And so I don't think that we're taught that, you know, when capitalists land in your hometown to do whatever they want to do, they're there for themselves. They're there for some type of profit. And you need to know that and you need to figure out a way to be capitalistic so that it can be mutual. That yeah, that individualism is something quite key. And you know what? I think we all kind of find it in different shapes and forms. Before we even go to the corporate space, I think it's small things. Somebody touched earlier on about being in a supermarket and someone being served before you by virtue of the color of their skin. And more often than not, I think the person who is being served isn't aware of it. So I've had incidences where I've had to say, right here, standing in front of you, am I not visible? You know, it's, <laughs> it's that sort of thing that can be really frustrating. And if it can happen in society, in day-to-day -day living, it begs the question of what actually happens in corporate spaces. And one way I would frame it is to say, at the point you're bringing expats in, you're subliminally communicating that we don't have a skill set to fit this particular need. We're bringing in expertise from abroad. Once that is 
that's entrenched in people's psyche. To then turn that narrative around and make people work from a collective standpoint rather than an individual standpoint may be a big ask. I put that out to our experts. Do you think that's the case or not? I don't think it's a unique problem for Africa. I think that, that experts, not all experts, but that people, some people, tend to go somewhere and stay within their own comfort zone. I, I see it everywhere, right? I, so I'm from the Netherlands, I live in Dubai, and um, the amount of people that I know here in Dubai that only have friends that are from their own country again, and this is a melting pot of everything, right? If you want to, you can you meet people from all over the world, but they have still only people from their own country. I think it's a, it's a human trait, I think. It's a comfort zone thing. So, so maybe it's not, and maybe it's a lack of awareness of the fact that, that they're doing that <laughs> sometimes, right? They, they, might actually, they might actually be more curious or interested in understanding more of the culture if they were like, taken out of that comfort zone. Um, and I think that's where we all have a job and companies have a job as well to, to try and, and kind of create that environment that people feel like that curiosity and I want you to know. But some people like genocide, like you're saying, I, I am the same. I am super interested. How, you know, what makes people tick? How is it like this? Why is it not like that? I mean, for me going for the first time to South Africa, I was like, wow, this is like, you know, you guys have like, you're coding people like in different categories. Like why, how? Like, you know, and, and understanding the whole background and all of that into it is, is for me, it was very interesting. I think for some people, it's maybe a little daunting. And, and, and so they might need a little bit more kind of help with that. Um, so I think if you bring experts in, you'll always have a group of people that are there to do a job and they're not interested in where they do it, whether that is the US or whether that is Zimbabwe or the Netherlands or Dubai, they just want to get the job done. Um, and I think there's a group that would like to, but feels maybe un unequipped for it. And, and there is a group that naturally would like to live in a different place because they're interested in understanding that place and that culture sure. and those people. Sure. So Ruby, you touched on something that piqued my interest earlier on. You were talking about this idea of getting into the office and having to say Shumba Nyamuziwa Mamukase, right? Talk to us about this because I struggle, and sorry, to, to our guests that is addressing somebody by their totem, essentially, mm -hmm. which for me is completely yeah. bizarre, right? I've never had to do that. I think I'd struggle in that sort of environment. What is it really like <laughs> exactly? Are you expected to do it properly as in culturally? Are you comfortable doing it even? And mm -hmm. is it considered normal? And then how do you adapt when you go to the real bigger world where that's just weird? Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'll speak to it and touch on what was just said just now. Um, and I was thinking about the responses and how we always talk about when in Rome, do what the Romans do, right? Um, that if you're going to go work in a country, you've got to adapt to what happens there. Or, and I know we bring it back to the workplace. We're not talking about just going to visit on holiday. Um, so if you're going to go and be integrated into a society, you've actually got to do what they do, what they do there. That's just respectful. And I think that's exactly what the social, social and cultural intelligence is about. Um, so for example, when I first visited Istanbul, I remember saying, oh, well, I have to wear a Punjab, you know, just out of respect, you know, depending on where you go, you might have to. If you go to Egypt, you know, if you're gonna go visit the mosques, you're gonna have to do that. So back to the workplace and the reality that I live in in Zimbabwe right now. Yeah, you see, I, I had a colleague who I used to deliberately call by his first name just to grind his gears because he thought that because he's much older than me, maybe by about um, 25 years older than me, um, and, but we were the same level in terms of directors, you know, just for giggles, I would literally call him by his first name and everyone in the room would always go, oh, how could you do that? You know, and even he used to feel that way. So without making it a specifically personal experience, it's just to say across the board, there are expectations. You hear it in government, you know, when you're around these social settings, I do a lot of events, you know, and all these things, even when you have a chief in the building, having a chief in the building in the Zimbabwean context is huge because it's got to be someone anogona kude temba, anototanga moresa chief, asadatumu moresa guest of honor, right? Then they have to actually go down on their knees and greet this chief who has graced us with his presence. So imagine the mixture of cultures that are in there. And it comes back down to, do you start an event with an opening prayer? Do you not? So it's all those things as well to say, well, who are you offending? Who are you not? What are you upholding? Zimbabwe is a Christian state. No problem. Some countries are based on that. But do you pray to God before you start an event? So I'll say that I face it firsthand. And if you don't do it, people do look at you funny, like you're offside or you're ungovernable or you're Generation X and look at them, look at them. They've lost their culture. So you'll definitely face backlash if you ignore it. So in some instances, you've got technology, especially for me with my job, I'm an MC. 
I've got to acknowledge the entire protocol, who's in the building, who's in the house, greetings to all. And if I do it in a way that is seen um, demeaning or I'm negating certain titles and processes or cultural traditions, then they'll just say I'm uncultured and I certainly won't be hired for the next event. So you've got wow. to play a ball. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've worked in environments where the, the way that you list people's name in an email thread could start World War Three. You put so-and-so's name before mine, that is such a big deal. And, you know, you kind of walk into these spaces, not assuming that actually matters. Uh, but people get really emotional about this sort of stuff. Tenesai, your, your uh, adaptation, talk us through. You know, I think I have had such a great time cross-cultural. And I'm going to give an example of a time when I went to this amazing village called Samburu Village. It's in Kenya. And I was working on a project about the Samburu women. And we have no language in common at all. No language. They speak, they don't even speak Swahili, right? This is a scene from National Geographic. These women are very traditional. It's beautiful, right? And I remember getting there and I'm thinking, how am I going to communicate what I want to say, right? And I remember getting into the village and the first thing I did, I'm a mother and they were all mothers with their kids is I went to the child and I held this child and I smiled, right? And I took the child and the mom came to me and then she hugged me. For me, it was me understanding that perhaps what can connect us in this is the fact that we are mothers and it could be an icebreaker and it could gravitate towards us being able to warming up. And for sure, I am this woman from Zimbabwe, they knew I was a foreigner, but they warmed up because of understanding that. But again, I actually, I'm a common purpose fellow and we studied cultural intelligence. We were taught cultural intelligence. I'm gonna go back to the aspect that I think we're not addressing the elephant in the room. It's something you're taught. Cultural intelligence is not something we are born with. The world has become a global village. We need to teach it. We're not teaching it. And if you don't teach people cultural intelligence, emotional intelligence, people are not going to be able to work. So the moral of the story is I want to go back to it and say, are we teaching it? Are we teaching people cultural intelligence? Because if we're not, then we can't assume it exists and we actually have a problem. Are our children in the curriculums learning cultural intelligence? Because by the time my son is out of school, the world is going to be a little village and he's not going to be working with people from Zim. He's going to be working for people from 1500 countries in one room. So the question is, are we teaching it? Because if we're not teaching it, then it doesn't exist. In all my career, I've never gone for a, a social intelligence uh, training session. I've done emotional intelligence and the studies will show emotional intelligence is about you and your response to your environment and your self-awareness, right? Social intelligence is about what everybody else is doing. So when you go for leadership training, the focus is very much on the individual and the individual getting it right and having the right mindset. But you, you pose an absolutely valid question on this. Are we teaching it? B, why aren't we teaching it? in organizations why is it not on the priority i know you can't speak for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but i am i am i so agree with you i so agree and for me personally um i have a seven-year-old daughter and the fact that she grows up in dubai with all these nationalities and she's in a class with 23 kids from like 14 different countries with different religious races like anything uh, you can think of i think it's just it's just amazing it's it's just gonna it's so much of an enrichment that she can, she can do that because i i totally agree with you i think it all starts with you know teaching people about you know the, the cultural differences and, and and making them aware and, and and feeding that curiosity um and I, I totally agree we need to teach them more so in in companies i think some companies have really woken up to this and they're doing so much on it like microsoft even uses neuroscience to to actually help you know engineers <laughs> who might not be the kind of the most prone to sort of wanting to really be open-minded and taking all that information in to help them sort of work through some of the um some of the actual data behind it so it's not just a, a fluffy thing it's there's data behind it um, and I think what, what you were saying about the, the smiling and actually like being sort of, you know, your, your whole verbal communication is very open, um, positive mindset has, has proven so much to kind of help, you know, open things up and make people be able to and wanting to, to learn more. And because and for some people, it, it's not a natural thing. They need to help. They need to be learned. Uh, they be taught to, to do this. So thanks, B. Rati, is that a fair indictment on engineers? You just got a dig there, right? That says that you guys don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually true. It's actually true. Engineers in general. Uh, in general. Yeah, in general, 
you are more closed, you are more, that actually I was an engineer, then I moved to marketing and I combined both, both subjects. But the truth, the, the reason, one of the re reasons I moved to marketing and then I combined both, it was something like that because I didn't want to be all the time just with a computer. I wanted to talk to people, to learn, to exchange experiences. And that's not the most common thing in engineers. But it's true. And here in Spain, I've seen nowhere at any level of education, any uh, cultural intelligence, uh, lessons, teaching, uh, bootcamp, whatever, anything. That's just never happened. Not in school, not in high school, not at uh, college. So I think that there's the, the, the problem. If that was uh, shown to kids since they are, they are small, uh, when we grew up, you can decide if you want to go out of your comfort zone or no, but then you, you have the tools or the, the you know, to deal with those situations. So I think there's sort of a theme. Most of the social professions definitely have go into it. I know for certain in medicine, anytime you start medical school, anytime you start any type of new rotation, there's modules upon modules upon modules of cultural intelligence modules that we have to do, social intelligence model modules that we need to do, um, emotional, all kinds of things that we have to do. And that just maybe is a, is, a, is, a, is a reflection of we're dealing with people all the time. So I was actually really interested to hear what Rothio was going to say with the engineering. So perhaps it's more so if you're in a uh, industry that doesn't necessarily have a lot of human um, interactions, i.e. like your human interactions are not the money source or where the income comes from. It seems to me that there isn't a lot of input into that area. So I don't know. I'm curious. Um, I, I think when Rathio transitioned to marketing, is, did you say that's when you started seeing some of these CQ things pop up, Rathio? I think I missed that part, but I was curious uh, to see it from engineering to marketing. Yeah. Uh, when you go to marketing, people uh, need to talk to each other and then you learn how to, how to understand or empathize or deal with mm -hmm. those things better. So we just have to follow the money. It almost seems like, right? Like the techie companies maybe thought it wasn't necessary for tech guys to, or tech dudes and dudesses, girls, um, to be involved in, in um, you know, social interactions. But that's where all of these jokes come from, right? Like even for us in medicine, I'm an emergency doc. So we're supposed to be like the more personable people want to meet your minutes and find out everything and kind of figure it out. But then we have radiologists that sit behind a computer and just look at your images. And the joke is that they're not as personable because they didn't really have to go through as many cultural competency modules as we did. And then just kind of learning on the job as well. So perhaps, you know, like B says, it does come from the bigger company itself, but at some level too, I think it's on the human, it's on the individual too. So we definitely are not teaching it. I think in medicine we are, but I think everybody just kind of needs to learn. But I think the teaching supposes that you know you're going to end up in a specific market, right? So I'll tell you, my first ever trip to the Middle East was a business trip, well actually my second. And I recall coming from a team meeting, my boss and a few unknown gentlemen were sitting in the lobby of the hotel that we're staying in. And my reaction was, ah, the boss is talking to people. I'm going to just quickly pass by because he smiled and beckoned me. I went, I said hello for I don't know that I'm not supposed to shake this man's hand. So Mucha goes there, reaches out. This guy's kind of looking at my hand a bit awkwardly and then reluctantly pick, you know, puts his out. So I'm thinking, oh, I've stumbled on a situation that I'm not welcome. I said my hellos and I left. The next morning, my boss sat me down. Our client was really upset. He thought you were not interested in who he is. You didn't stay to talk and engage with him. He thought you didn't think it was important enough to spare time for. And I'm coming with my European context, which is to say, I'm waiting to be invited. If you haven't invited me, that means it's time for me to move on. So it's, it's something that I think sometimes we stumble upon these trainings. And of course, since then, I knew not to extend my hand unless I knew the person was open to shaking hands with females. I knew to show interest by asking a few questions and also just the dialogue of going from speaking for 35 minutes about family, you've gone to talk about a specific deal, you've got to talk about family and about travels, summer holidays, what you did three years ago, what's gonna happen in five years time before you actually start talking business. So there are all sorts of nuances that you need to learn. And very often you're just kind of finding it out as you go along, which makes it difficult for anybody looking to train. Rothio? That's interesting you said about families because I've got a 
two and a half year old girl. And I found out after I had them, before it was a little bit of an issue that I was getting pregnant, etc. But afterwards, I found in different countries that it's kind of a point of union between people to yes. talk about motherhood. So, so that's, that's a pretty cool thing that you can use personal uh, intimate stuff to, to connect with people in a work environment. Ravenna, and I had an interesting conversation once where um, we spoke about how when men come together, they seldom ask each other about how many kids they have and what their family structure is. But women, it's a natural inclination for both men and women to ask women what their family situation is. And I wondered why is that for culture? And I think this transcends countries, this transcends geographies. There's just a natural inclination to want to know what a woman's marital status is. Does this matter in the workplace? I find, I find it very offensive, very, very offensive and very <laughs> polarizing because I'm, you know, I've come into scenarios where people will say, Dr. Mona, is that Mrs. or is that Miss? I'm like, what business of yours is it if it's Mrs. or Mrs.? Like, this isn't a romantic interaction. Um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't ask you if your mister is a married mister or a non-married mister. So that's kind of, you know, like, is what, what, what Ravenico was saying, that leave those things out because there's really no space for it. We're here in this professional setting. <laughs> And that's really where you need to stay because now you're going to blur the lines. And then for the most part, that's where a lot of these uncomfortable interactions happen where you say something that you may not know. I mean, for me, a lot of assumptions are I'm a Zimbabwean, so I should understand. And I do understand, but sometimes I just ignore it because I don't want to deal with it, you know? So I think a lot of the things like Ruvenoko said, you just need to, why are you asking what my marital status or my womb status is? It's like, who cares? We're here to talk about medicine. But in, 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 the, in the Middle East, as, as Mucha is saying, it's actually very polite to ask after how many children you have and wish you like uh, that you're a rich person because you have so many children. And so it's actually, I agree with you. I, I come from a country as well where it's a bit like, why are you asking me that? It's none of your business. But I think this is where you come into cultural intelligence and understanding like Mucha had. Like in some countries, this might not be because people are just being rude and asking things you don't want to share but because it's the norm to be able to wish you you're a rich person amazing you have three four five kids this is fantastic wow yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm poor say, zero. i just want to say that <laughs> mona you are hilarious okay like i literally am listening i'm like oh my god you're too much no but what i want to say is on the reverse right um i find it very awkward when i go to other countries and i'm dealing with older people and I have to call them by their first name. I know I talked about it earlier, like I was saying, just because I'm exposed, I don't agree with it in Zim. Um, in Zim, it's a little bit annoying because sometimes people will use it for different reasons. But when I do travel, I still find that my cultural, um, you know, that like uh, Chen Sai was saying that we are taught this. This is what is indoctrinated in us from day one when we're born. That no matter where you are in the world. So I will give way to somebody. I will let an older person say it. I will talk to them as though they're my elder, even though they might be my equal in that particular context. Um, but it also comes to what I wanted to say about, um, you know, we keep, I'll keep bringing back this point because for me, this is my backbone of this conversation, is to say, should we be teaching social and cultural intelligence? What does that even mean? Because we should be really teaching emotional intelligence just on a level of tolerance. If you learn how to tolerate other human beings for their differences, we shouldn't be teaching. What, what do you teach when you say social intelligence or cultural intelligence? What are you teaching exactly? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, I feel like everybody is different in the world. This panel itself is different. Look at our hairstyles, look at our dressing, look at our skin tone. We are all different. Okay. And ain't nobody here is sitting here calling each other out because ah, you know, we're live on TV. Why didn't you show? You know, it's it's really a preference thing and it's tolerance. I think we just need to learn respect as human beings. Um, where our so deep as genuine and fundamental respect for each other as human beings, regardless of where we're from, what age we are, what race, creed, whatever. So that's how, how I, I would look at it. I'll tell a story about how we teach kids. My yeah. son went, when I was uh, young, went to a, a school in, in England, a, a private school, where he came home from school really upset one day. Mummy, we were being asked to draw pictures of ourselves. And I used a brown paint. My teacher took the brown paint away and gave me a black paint and insisted that I paint my face black. So he was reading. Everybody was laughing at my picture. It was put up on the wall and it's just horrible, right? So the mm -hmm. next morning I go to school to see what this portrait is. 
And lo and behold, teacher is like, oh yeah, we all would teach. Even the way she spoke to me was quite patronizing. We were teaching children that, you know, everybody in the world comes, in, okay, you were teaching kids diversity, yep. Um, you know, everyone comes in different shapes and colors and I've got brown kids in the class. So I thought it was inappropriate for him to paint himself brown. The only brown kid in the class was Sri Lankan who has a darker skin tone than my son does. So I'm automatically riled by this. And you know, my thing is, should he choose to paint himself green, allow him to express the way he chooses to, that is, belongs in a slave museum, quite frankly. It was an atrocious piece of artwork and it developed a bit of a complex quite early on. So the idea of teaching, actually, we need to educate ourselves as people leading in these sorts of environments in order to responsibly teach generations to come. Because if we get that wrong, we've kind of messed up kids from quite a tender formative age which is truly unfortunate what does that look like though like Ruben Oko asked though right like what does it look like so does it mean that uh you know B's company or Rothio's company or you Mucha um when you hire somebody from another place and you bring them to this new location you invest, your company invests in saying, okay, we have Ruben Noko, who a lot of her experience is within the continent, but she's well-traveled and, you know, open-minded. Let's bring her and just tell her about some of all of these social nuances and all of these social nuances in this actual location that we're in. Mm -hmm. Is that something that companies are doing? Is that something that we think is viable, even like cost effective to do that? Is that going to help the teams work a little bit better? If I, if I don't take offense when people think I'm poor because I have zero children, I'm curious. So I'll jump in quickly and say, I've taken it upon myself in corporate spaces to do a doing business in type series, which suggests we're going into new markets. We need to understand what the nuances of those markets are. These are the cultural norms. If it's the Middle East, you're not going to go in for a kiss with a gentleman, you're not going to extend your hand, you're not going to tell, you know, dodgy jokes and that sort of thing, because it's a culture that's intolerant to such. Um, if you are of a different sexual orientation, you're not going to go talking about what you did last weekend, because that's highly offensive. So there's several things that I think organizations think they do well, but I think we could be more overt with such trainings. It could just be information you put on an internet site, rather than calling people into large classrooms. Because actually, when you're trying to get the job done, very often you can't dedicate two hours to a training session that you don't necessarily see the need for in the short to medium term. You might have a different view, Rocio and B. I don't know if I have a clear mindset about that. Genesai? Um, Look, I am very of the fact that we need to teach cultural intelligence. It goes without saying. I think it, it's important because it's going to build better teams, more effective teams, because I think there's a point that was made about diversity and, uh, col and uh, collectivism. Um, if we don't teach cultural intelligence, like you've just given an example of the metacognitive element of cultural intelligence, where you preempt a situation, right? Where you say, I'm going to Kenya or I'm going to Dubai. The people are like this and you preempt it for your team, right? So I think one of the things that uh, when OMB was talking about the definition of cultural intelligence, is there's these four things to cultural intelligence. If we're not teaching them, then no one is going to pay attention to it. You're not actually going to know how to harness it. Is it absolutely import important? Yes. Emotional quotient, I completely agree with it. It's, it's, it's the thing that grounds us, the thing that helps us handle our emotions. It's that Hunu heart. In Shona, we call it Hunu. We call it Ubuntu, your humanity, the side of you. But cultural intelligence is actually something that needs to be taught. It's, you can't wake up and understand it. You just, you can't, it's impossible. And it's got these four things that you need to pay attention to. You need to have the drive, you need to have the knowledge, you need to have the strategy and you need to have the action. So it's not just what I say, it's also how I behave. And Mucha, you gave a very good example of it when you, when you went to Dubai for the meeting. It's, there's so many elements of it. So if you don't know the moving parts, you won't be able to harness or you won't be able to build strong teams. You won't be able to innovate as much. So I think it needs to be taught. The question now is how? And one last thing I need to say, Singapore, is actually is starting to build it into their curriculum. And if you look at how Singapore is performing, they're building cultural intelligence into the curriculum of their schools. Because you're looking 10 years from now, the, the workforce is going to look so different, right? Um, so you no, know, you absolutely need to teach it. Um, and, 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 and sold on emotional intelligence, absolutely. But cultural intelligence definitely must be taught. 
that's my my stance yeah i yeah. i uh, again i agree with genocide <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it's no and, and i think what, what you were saying about the practicalities of a country is one thing but, but what we need to teach people is this mindset um, and it's the mindset. It's it's a it's a growth mindset. It's it's a it's a self awareness uh, uh, and an openness and a curiosity. And that's what we that's what we need to instill in them to to make them aware of like you know this is this is how your how your behavior, your posture, your nonverbal communication, anything comes across, um, and that they're aware of that. So that I am being Dutch. I am the Dutch tend to be perceived as rude and forward and aggressive and all those kind of good stuff. Bit like the New Yorkers, um, <laughs> they, they they kind of get to the point quite quickly, and that was something I had to become very aware of in 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 my working life because actually you know in some cultures that was was really frowned upon, and if I wanted to get you know lead people, if I wanted to get people to to you know feel that they were in a, in their right safe space to perform well, I should tone that down, right? So so learning those kind of things and becoming aware of yourself and having like that flexible mindset. I think that's what's most important. The rest you can find on Google. Um, I think that's what we need to get to. <laughs> Brilliant. And our judge, Natsai Manyarara. Hi, Natsai. Nice to have you online. Is saying, I agree that tolerance may be the answer, but a sign of respect in one culture may be offensive in, an, um, in the extreme in another. Tolerance may well require cultural awareness. It's a tough one. And I, I completely agree with that. It is indeed a tough call. Right, so ladies, as we round up, because we're getting to the top of the hour, if not already, I just wanted to get a view from each and every one of you, what you think are universal, cultural, and social norms that anybody who's either in a leadership position, is a new entrant into the market, should be equipped with. Okay, I'll, I'll say be humble. Be humble, yeah, okay. Environment. So that's cultural, social, one of each. Uh, I think it's both. It's, it's yeah. universal, okay, Got, gotcha. Right, so we've got humility, Mona. I'm gonna go with adding curiosity, so humble curiosity. So if you ask your questions humbly, I think nobody's gonna take offense to it. I agree to the, 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 the other two, but I, I'd like to add self-awareness to that. For me, learn to learn is always constant. Just have a learning mindset, go in there. I'll go with tolerance. I think okay. um, you know, you've got to be able to, to accept everyone for what they are. Um, no matter what. Um, it shouldn't be something you question. So uh, combined with all of that, the humility, the, the when someone does that or dresses that way, you're tolerant enough to accept them the way that they are. Mm, so I exactly. think it's that for me, tolerance. So I've got one that kind of counters humility a little bit because I think you need a boldness to be in these sorts of spaces, right? You've got to be confident. You've got to be bold. And sometimes I don't think people get that balance just right so uh, i think a lot of people suppress the, the, there's a perception that if you're bold and you're overly confident you're arrogant and it takes away from that humility which you can try to be both you can try to be both you can try to be both i think i definitely have a phrase that i read i can't even really remember where i read it i think it was lords i'm not sure um but it's kind of stuck with me all week and i've been reflecting it and kind of forwarding it a lot to a lot of my friends and on my socials, but it's like unity is our strength, right? Kind of with everything that's going on with the world and how hectic life is and stressful and just unplanned, we really need to unite. So humility comes through, you know, curiosity comes through, like just learning to learn comes through, but diversity is our power. That's how we get really powerful. So unity is our strength but diversity is our power. And if we want to be powerful in whatever spaces we need to be in, we need to sort of incorporate all of the single words that we've all came up with and find a way to make it powerful, I think. That's, and that's kind of been resonating with me all week. So I just want I to share. love, 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 love that. Love that. Final words of wisdom, ladies, before we call time. I already went. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> Final words of wisdom. If there's one thing that people need to take away from tonight's show, what is it? both to corporates or individuals? I would say try at least once to go out of your comfort zone and meet all the people in all the other cultures. At least once okay. in your life. Maybe you like it. And find out how rich life can be if you start embracing all the different cultures. It's an amazing sure. experience. You need to learn cultural intelligence. So find a course, teach your children, find a course. I mean, I think it's out there. I just think you need to learn it. It's not, you're not going to earn it. You just need to learn it. 
So teach your children, teach yourselves, and we just need to keep learning. And I would say teaching, it doesn't mean you're diluting your own culture. If anything, you're strengthening it and you're preparing your children for a global world. Ladies, I want to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to our guests, first and foremost, B and Rafio. If you joined late, you are going to have to watch this again because there's so much information that's worth just kind of thinking about and seeing how you can apply it to your day to day, day to day, socially, privately, and most importantly, in the workspace, which is what this show is all about. Thank you all very much for logging in to our traditional weekly session, Professional Tribes, where we talk all things employment, we talk all things corporate, we want to empower individuals, we want to empower corporates, feed into ideologies, policies, the works. Thanks to everybody who's logged in. We love your company. Join us again the same time next week for another riveting discussion. We actually missed you guys last week, but for good reason, we took a hiatus. So we're back and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everybody, and good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.